growing up in our home church, uh, our church put on their own summer camp, so to speak. It's similar to what Amy and her crew does at Camp Naoti, and it was a lot of fun. And in addition to arts and crafts and swimming and taking hikes and playing games, we studied the Bible a lot of time in the Bible. We had lessons on abstaining from dancing and mixed bathing and from alcohol and tobacco and avoiding both the birds and the bees altogether, whatever that meant. But finally, on, on the last day of camp, they presented what affectionately became known as the Triple R Lesson, Romans Road to Redemption. And, and see if this sounds familiar, if you've heard this this kind of presentation given to you. Romans 3.23, all of us have sinned. Hey, that's me. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. I've got a problem. And then they would take us down the hill for their cross-burning devotional. And at the Devo, we were presented with Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. While we were yet sinners, Christ died on our behalf. So God's done something about my problem. In Romans 6.3, we unite with him in the waters of baptism, and then we would head over to the swimming pool for those that wanted to give their life to the Lord. And after they came up, they talked about, well, let's talk about what's next. That's Romans chapter 6 and verse 18. We become a slave to righteousness. Translation, be good. We'll define what good is. We'll go back to the lessons we had earlier in the week, and don't drink, don't chew, and stay away from girls that do. Okay, so that, that was basically the essence of the gospel message that I heard growing up. And, and really what I took from that is, is what we really needed from the first four books of the New Testament was what happened on the cross with Jesus and his death. Well, what do we do with the story of Jesus, his teachings, his life up until that point? I mean, sure, they're great stories, but ro- what role do they play in helping us deal with our sin problem? I mean, we love the story of, 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 of the guy that's there by the pool and is healed and, uh, you know, at the temple, you know, at the pool of Siloam, and that's nice. But how does that help me get to heaven, right? My first year at Twickenham, I was preaching on a, a text in the book of Mark. And someone that doesn't go to our church that had been listening online called me on, on Monday morning, and he wanted to talk about my lesson. And he just said, hey, uh, why are you preaching on a text on that side of the cross? Because you know it's not gospel. Well, I thanked him for his call and his unsolicited feedback. And, you know, after I hung up, I I got to feeling bad. And I got to thinking about it. Wow, to think Jesus never got to preach the gospel message. It's just a shame. But, you know, look, that's tongue in cheek. It really is. But looking back, outside of kind of an interesting backstory to the gospel message, what we heard from in in Bible class and in youth group and campus ministry had no real need for the story of Jesus' life. And in hindsight, you know, that glaring omission uh, should have have set off alarms that, that perhaps our gospel message and our God is far too small. Well, how do we get to this point? Well, there had been an ongoing historical argument that had gone for, for decades and, and generations that divided Jesus into either being a wise rabbi or he was a messianic savior. And so was Jesus a wise teacher to admire and to imitate or was he truly the savior to believe in and to worship? And so you have these two simplified views that are kind of pitted against one another. In the first camp, you see Jesus, he's this astute teacher. And you look at his teachings and just say, we can really admire his ethics and his compassion and the way that he related with people. Let's embrace what we can all say is good. Well, Amy Jill Levine, who teaches New Testament studies up at Vanderbilt, kind of summarized this whole way of thinking. She said, virtually all modern scholars of antiquity agree that Jesus was a Jewish teacher a rabbi from Galilee who preached his message orally and was baptized by John the Baptist and was crucified in, in Jerusalem on the orders of the Roman perfect Pontius Pilate. But being a self-described Yankee Jewish feminist, she said, that's as far as I'm willing to go. 
So you have the miraculous events and you have the resurrection and these messianic claims. What are you going to do with all those? She said they either need to be minimized or dismissed. My first thought when when I'm reading this article of hers is, isn't it great that Vandy has her teaching college students about the story of Jesus? But that's for another day. In the opposing view, the other camp says, no, 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 you've got it all wrong. Jesus is the Savior, and it's all about his death and the resurrection and that provides forgiveness and the hope of eternal life. We have to embrace that. And at the same time, well, his life and teachings, well, they're great and they're to be admired, but they're eclipsed by the atoning work he did on our behalf. It's all about the cross. Well, if you're unsure as to which camp we have traditionally landed in, I want you to reach up and and grab the Grace Songbook and flip over to the back. Lincoln and I were talking about this during worship service. He said, you've got to see this. And so not only looking in the back of the songbook, uh, you go ahead and, and just look under Savior, and you'll see all of the songs that are listed. He said it goes further than that. If you look at the database, he said there are 167 matches for the word Savior. He said there are another 45 songs that mention Save Yours, apostrophe S. Well, how many, I was curious, mention Rabbi or Rabboni or Teacher? He said there's only one in the whole songbook. Well, why we did that? Well, we want to make sure that we declare and proclaim that Jesus indeed died on our behalf. That's central to who we are and central to we, we have to have the cross if we're going to be brought back to God. Yes, but can he be our teacher too? That's our question. Can he be both rabbi and savior? I think there are three reasons that we've kind of resisted this whole idea of looking at Jesus as a teacher or a rabbi. The first is we want to uproot the cross. Let me explain it with a a story. During my youth ministry um, days, Jill and I would have teenagers over to our house on Monday nights for Bible study. And generally, Jill would try to provide some type of food for the kids that we'd eat afterwards. Well, one of my seniors, Alan, showed up and he said, I'm starving, I'm about to die, I've got to have something to eat right now. I said, well, Jill made a, a, you know, 11 by 14 or 18 casserole, big Pyrex dish of of chicken and rice. It's there on the stove, she just pulled it out. If you want, go get you a little. And so for the next 15 minutes, he was in the kitchen and Jill and I were greeting those that came by. When it was time to start the Bible study, I, I walked in and said, Alan, you ready? And I looked down, and he had that whole Pyrex dish there with this fork, and it looked like he had been mining on a treasure hunt. I said, what are you doing? He goes, I only like the chicken. And so he's kind of picking through this entire casserole designed for the whole Bible study, just pulling out the chicken. I think sometimes we do that with the cross. I want to bring the cross into my story because I've got a sin problem. And you don't know how big the sin problem is in my life. I've got to have the cross because I need Jesus to fix it. And only Jesus' sacrifice can help me get right with God. So Jesus and the cross facilitates my personal salvation story. And if you think about it, it's almost like a transaction. I've got a problem. I've got a bill that I can't pay. And Jesus is willing to pay that for me to, to take on my sins so I can go to heaven when I die. And so that becomes my plan of salvation. And and what I see kind of laid out here in the book of Romans. And isn't that kind of what Paul is getting at? All this stuff behind is great. But let me just tell you, on this side of the cross, if you're coming into the Jesus story, this is what you need. You need to embrace the cross of Christ. Is that what Paul really intended for us? Let's take a second look. If you have your Bibles, turn to me to Romans chapter 1. You've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts, and then Romans becomes the first of the letters there. Romans chapter 1, I want us to just read the first three verses and see if this is the foundation for the rest of the book and what Paul is trying to describe in this gospel. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for what? The gospel of God. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures, regarding his son, who as to his human nature was a descendant of David. 
What Paul is saying is before we even get, get started, from the get-go, you've got to understand this Jesus that we're proclaiming that the story is, is bigger than just what you're seeing here. You can't understand the gospel if you don't understand the context of the Jesus story. He was first and foremost the resolution of Israel's story. He brings to completion the story of God's people. Where God had called Abraham and sent him out and said, you're going to be a light unto the nations. You're going to pull them all to me. He said, that is being brought to a head here. And all this story of God's people is found in the scriptures of the Old Testament. King David and the prophets had pointed to this person, pointed to this moment, pointed to God's actions here, and he is it's all coming about. His kingdom is being formed. But Adam and Eve and Abraham and Sarah and the 12 tribes of Israel were unable to do Jesus, God's Son, the Messianic Messiah is bringing it about. To gospel is to declare this story. And it's going to be this entire story and God's work to pull people back. That's what's going to save people from their sins. God's redemption plan and it's revolving around the story of Israel. And Paul is declaring from the very beginning, this gospel I bring to you is full of the story of Jesus. You've got to look at it in entirety. It's resolving this tension that's been there since the Garden of Eden. Number two, I think sometimes we don't want to diminish the cross. That's why sometimes we, we don't want to, to look and, and look at Jesus and his teachings as, as something that's applicable because we, we don't want to diminish the cross. And some very conscientious people, I mean, this sounds good, believe that we can't ask anyone to do anything to join with God or to become more like Christ for fear that we rob the power and the importance of what Jesus did on the cross. When Colby was in Boy Scouts, our troop met at, at another church here in town, and we were there in their youth, um, youth room, and, and as the meeting was getting started, I was kind of walking around checking things out, and I noticed from a good 40 feet away, there was a giant poster in the middle that said baptism. I was like, oh, good for these guys. I didn't know that they uh, really held up baptism in, in high regard. And so I was pretty comforted. Well, after the scout meeting, I walked by, and I noticed there were some words above it and some words below. And here's what the poster ended up saying. No work of the flesh, including baptism, can save you from sin. So that, that's what it was all about. And then underneath it had a scripture, scripture reference from Romans 3, 28. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from observing the law. You know, when Luther translated this passage, he added in the word alone. So no work of the flesh alone, you know, you know can, can save you. But that's not in the Greek text. And so if we look at the, the whole context of this, it, is Paul really trying to downplay our response to Jesus in, in discipleship? Well, the very next verse, Romans 3.29 says, Is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles too? Yes, of the Gentiles too. Paul's simply trying to say that this gospel, this message of Jesus Christ is for Jews and Gentiles alike. There were all sinners in need of salvation. And Jesus, the promised Messiah, he is the way to bring us to God. You know, he is the way. Following the teachings of Jesus and the ways of Jesus don't diminish the cross. It sends us to the cross. I love the story of Alexander the Great who was traveling through and his conquests were well known. People knew who he was and they were fearful of him. But he happened to be out one day with just a, a small company of soldiers and they walked up on this strongly defended walled city that was right there on the coast and it was over this giant cliff. And he walked up very boldly and asked for the king of that nation to come and, and talk with him. And so the king walked up after they went and summoned him to the edge of the wall. And Alexander yelled up, surrender immediately. Well, the king kind of chuckled to himself. And he says, well, I hate to tell you, I, I know that you're this powerful guy, but we have you vastly outnumbered. And Alexander says, well, let me allow you to demonstrate why you su should surrender. So he asked his soldiers to line up and start walking towards the cliff. He said, I'll tell you when to stop. And so the guys started walking and walking. They got to the edge of the cliff. And the first one walked off. 
and fell over a hundred feet to his death on the rocks below, and then the next, and then the next. After ten soldiers fell to their death, Alexander halted the troops and asked them to come back and rejoin him. Well, the king knew that nothing would stop the eventual victory if these soldiers were so sold out and willing to die for their leader. And that's what we're called to do, is to die for our leader, to say, this is what Jesus has done for us. Our life is going to be lived in response. I, I think the final reason we diminish the teachings and discipleship of Jesus is some just don't want to take up the cross. The other day, Colby and I were working on a project for school in the garage, and we had painted a big section of plywood, and we had left it to dry. And that happened to be in the parking spot where Jill usually parks, but I thought she could see the paint buckets and everything, but she was careful not to hit something else over here, and so she drove on in over the project, and she hit a, a, a pint or a, a quart of paint, and when she hit it, it just flattened it, and it splattered paint on my truck. Well, it was about 34 degrees out, my fo my, uh, uh, the faucet there was frozen, so I decided to take it down to Lee's car wash. I've never taken my, uh, down to Lee's, and I was kind of interested that when I showed up, there was a woman there, she had a park on, and she goes, let me tell you about all the different things that Lee's will do for you. So I was like, well, tell me. She goes, well, we can vacuum out your carpets, we can shampoo your carpets, we can go in and, and dress your wheels and we can uh, take care of all your windows and we can put a protectant on the dash. And I mean, she's just going through all this different things. I said, I just want you to take care of the paint problem on the outside. So she kind of looked a little disgusted and she kind of handed the thing. She goes, put this on your dash. It said, outside only. And I was kind of offended, outside only. But that's what I came for. I wanted to take care of the problem that I had on the outside if someone else wants to spend extra time there in 34 degree temperatures getting their car detailed, go for it. But sometimes I, I think that we do that in our faith. We just kind of want to take care of the outside. I've, I've got this sin problem. and Let's just knock the dirt off. You know, if, and if we can buy into the idea that Paul was giving us an updated version of discipleship, you know, kind of discipleship 201, then it nullifies all the tough teachings we don't want to do. We don't want to follow all the stuff in the Sermon on the Mount. You know, all the stuff that he talked about, lust and anger and selling our possessions, loving our enemies. Can't we just let the radicals do that? I, I, I just want the basics. I want to take care of this and move on. How hard is this kind of, or how prevalent is this half-hearted discipleship? Well, I typed in my web browser this week, gospel. Just the word gospel, see what would come up. And I noticed on wikianswers.com, it popped up, how do you spread the good news of Jesus Christ? That was the question. I was like, I want to find out what they have to say about that. Well, the answer is, well, might as well pray and sing and talk about him. But don't ever take the Lord's name in vain, for that's one of the Ten Commandments. You can worship him, and especially follow the Ten Commandments. That was it. That's how you spread the good news of Jesus. And, and my first thought was, man, I'm glad Wiki Answers got their top theologian on that one, you know, to tackle this. But the, that's the prevailing sentiment in the world around us. Just be good. Don't sin too much. Don't offend people. And worship God when you can, when it's convenient. The only problem is Paul would say not so fast on this updated version of discipleship. What was the earliest Christians called? Back in his day, they were called the way. Was it Paul's way? No, it was Jesus' way. In fact, Paul kind of uh, urges the Corinthians to imitate my example. And then he sends the disciple Timothy to be with them. And he says this, Timothy is going to remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. Paul's completely bottled in, uh, bought in and is modeling the way of Jesus Christ. He says, it's not just about this gospel message that, that we somehow uh, have, have, have narrowed down there. He says, a whole way of living, living like Jesus. Scott McKnight in the King Jesus Gospel said, when we go down through any one of these roads, he said, we hijack the meaning of the gospel. He said the result of this hijacking is that the word gospel no longer means 
in our world what it originally meant in either Jesus or the apostles. If the gospel isn't about transformation, it isn't the gospel of the Bible. You know, until we buy into this holistic way of looking at Jesus, that yes, he's our savior, but he's also our rabbi and teacher, I think we're going to struggle with transformation in our own lives. We're also going to struggle as a church until we buy in and say we've got to be, like Steve was talking about, people that are proclaiming and living out Jesus to the people around us. You know, we've got to do that as a church. When Jesus kicks off his ministry that we read about in the Gospels, what exactly did he ask people to do? Repent, allow me to come into your heart. He says, no, repent, the kingdom of God is here. The thing you've been waiting for is happening. I'm ushering it in. Come be a part of this. So he's announcing this. And he, the coming dominion of God is here. And these stories back that up, casting out demons. We have him healing the blind and befriending the sinner. And we have him restoring the leper. They're all demonstrating what God's reign and God's rule and God's kingdom look like. And he's asking people, come, repent, put your life aside so you can join in this ministry, join in this calling to usher in this kingdom. That's what it's all about. It's not just Jesus' story. And it's not just the, the, the good news that I pull into my life. It's Jesus' story and our story as well. And Jesus' story is to continue on. Daniel Kirk shares this. Jesus' ministry is both the one-time unique set of deeds that inaugurates the coming reign of God, but is also the script for the ongoing life of the church. That's what we're called to do. We continue what Jesus did in his ministry as Christ's followers. This morning, I want to encourage us to take the account of the cross, put it back in the story of Jesus, and let's look at it as a whole to see what God was up to in an extension, what we're supposed to be up to as well. You know, if we look at this story as our marching orders, continuing the work he started, I think we'll begin to ask different questions when reading the text. Instead of, um, how do I get to heaven when I die? We, we start exploring and looking at the things saying, what does it look like to live in God consciousness? And, and thinking about God's purposes in everyday life like Jesus did. Totally different way of looking at things. It's clear that Jesus intended for his disciples and later for us to follow in and, and do the things that he taught. John 14 and verse 23 says, Jesus replied, if anyone loves me, he's going to obey my teachings. My father will love him. We will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me will not obey my teachings. These words you hear are not my own. Belong to the father who sent me. You know, we call out a few verses and call it our plan of salvation, separating it from the story. It, it's almost like we're tearing a page out of a family album. And that family album is important because when you look at the history of a family, you know, and you, you look at this album and start flipping through it over the holidays maybe, it reminds you of your past, where you've come from, but it also helps us to understand our future, where we're heading. So I'm going to encourage us that our relationship with God is not just about us. It's that our story belongs in that family album. It's a continuation of what God's been doing all along. You know, for Paul, the gospel is this salvation unleashing story of Jesus, the Son of God, the Messianic Messiah, the Emmanuel. He brings to completion this story of Israel that's found in scriptures He's the one that has provided us finally the way back to our Heavenly Father. And God invites us to the wholeness of His kingdom, to living into a truth that will change and transform our lives, to be disciples walking in His footsteps and learning from Him, learning what it truly means to love your enemies, to turn the other cheek, to forgive even when it's difficult, to live life where you're not controlled by lust and jealousy and greed, to take up our crosses and follow him, and truly just to say, my life means nothing. It's all about Christ. May Jesus truly be our Savior and our Rabbi. You know, this morning, for those that have not confessed the name of Christ, it still rings true. 
all of us have sin and fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin apart from Jesus Christ is death. It's what we deserve. God knew from the very beginning of time that this would be the plan, that this would be the circumstance we find ourselves in. So God, before he even created the world, had a plan in store for us, a plan that involved his love. And because of that great love, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us to bring us back to the Father. You know, this morning he's calling you to join him in the waters of baptism, to participate in the death, burial, and resurrection. We put to death our old self and allowed the new person to be born, that new creation to live differently continuing the work and ushering in the kingdom of our Heavenly Father. For some, you're like, I, yeah, but I don't know exactly what we're supposed to do after that. Allow Jesus to be your Savior. Allow Him also to be your teacher, because they're one and the same. He's calling us to learn from Him. He tells us in, the, in Scripture, His yoke is easy and His burden is light. He tells us that we might have life and have it to the fullest if we're united with him. So the invitation is there for us this morning. If you want to make Jesus your savior, if you want to make Jesus your rabbi, if you want to make him the Lord of your life, we invite you to come this morning as we stand and as we sing. You are holy and you are mighty. You are worthy. Worthy of praise, I will follow, and I will listen, I will love you all of my days. He is Lord of lords, He is King of kings, He is mighty God, Lord of everything, He's Emmanuel. Prince of Peace, who is the Lamb? He's the living God, He's my saving grace. He will reign forever, He is ancient of days. He's the Alpha, Omega, beginning and end. He's my Savior, Messiah, Redeemer, and Friend. He's my Prince of Peace, and I will live my life for Him. You are holy. You are mighty, you are worthy, worthy of praise. I will follow, and I will listen, I will love you all of my days. I will sing. My Savior, Messiah, Redeemer, and Friend. He's my Prince of Peace, and I will live my life for Him. If you remain standing for just a second, uh, thank you to Walton and to Lee and to Steve and to Brad for uh, allowing them to be a vessel of God to speak to us this morning. Amen? Great to be here. Thank you for being here. A couple of things as we close. 
June Montgomery called, and Jim is very ill. Jim is in NICU at the hospital, but June has asked us, no calls, no visits, and don't even call at the house because when she's not there, she's resting. So wanted us to know, keep her, them in your prayers, but uh, please uh, allow them to kind of deal with this as it comes. Retreats coming up. Men's and women's retreats are coming up next month. Information and registration are available in the gym lobby downstairs as soon as we conclude here in just a moment. And the spring is tonight at 5 o'clock. If you regularly attend the spring, would you raise your hand? All hands up who regularly attend the spring. Okay? If your hand's not up, I want you to ask somebody after service if it's meaningful and well-spent time to be here at 5 o'clock. And if they say yes, then I would encourage you to come back and see if it's meaningful for you as well. If they say no, they're wrong, and you should come back and try anyway. <laughs> Five o'clock right here in the auditorium. TCM Parents, Twickenham Children's Ministry. Every family this year has a copy of the Max Lucado devotional book, Grace for the Moment. There are still 20 families who haven't picked those up. They're in the fellowship hall downstairs on a table over on the side. I think it's that side. And you can pick those up today if you would. And this quick reminder about upcoming event that's a couple months down the road. Every year, our annual Mission Contribution Sunday for the Hacienda of Hope in Ecuador, um, we take once a year, is coming up on March the 2nd. So keep that out there on your radar that we've got a big day coming up in just a couple of months. Oh, as always, check your bulletin for other things that are going on. Thanks for being here. Have a great day. We'll see you at 5, and let's pray together as we close. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today and thank you for the time that we've had here together this morning to, to worship and to hear, to hear your message. Uh, we pray that you be with us and allow our hearts to, to accept the message and the, the worship that went on here today and help us to take that into the world and to be, a, to be a vessel to be able to get that out to those that may not know about you. We pray that you uh, be with us as we're out in that world this week and pre please bring us back here together. Um, at this time next week. Please God guard and direct us in everything that we do, and it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen.